fun fact about Odd Salon, if you successfully apply to talk, you will be introduced to your soulmate and, and get someone to actually officiate for you at your wedding. So, good evening. Uh, my name is Colin Alexander, and I'm here to talk about that time when Sir Arthur Con Conan Doyle, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle of Sherlock Holmes fame, decided it wasn't enough to write about the world's most famous detective, but he had to actually go out and help solve a real mystery and, ex and exonerate an accused and convicted uh, non-murderer. <laughs> so in 1908, the murder of Marion Gilchrist was considered without parallel, parallel in criminal history. She was a rich widow, 82 years old, living in Glasgow, Scotland, and she'd collected over 100 pieces of jewelry valued in today's dollars at about $400,000. And on December 21st, 1908, her maid, the only other person in the house, left for about 10 minutes. And when the maid returned, Miss Gilchrist had been brutally murdered, her face bashed in, every bone broken. The clue was a crescent-shaped diamond brooch identified as stolen. So police put out the word everywhere to pawnbrokers, look out for such a piece. So it's 1908. The police in Glasgow look for the usual suspects, and it's Victorian society. So these are the undesirables, the poor, foreigners, gamblers, pimps, and Jews. What if one person could fit all of these descriptions? <laughs> Enter Oscar Slater. German, Jew, gambler, alleged pimp. Slater lived approximately five minutes from the scene of the crime, He'd book passage upon the Lusitania, which I hear is a ship, <laughs> and was bound for San Francisco under an assumed name. <laughs> Police learned about him because he had recently pawned a crescent-shaped diamond brooch. <laughs> so according to Joe Bell, who was the uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's teacher in med school and the actual uh, basis for Sherlock Holmes. The fatal mistake for the ordinary policeman that they make is he gets his theory first and then he makes the facts fit it. Instead of getting his facts first and basing and making all of his little observations and deductions until he is driven irresistibly by them in a direction he may never have originally contemplated. Problem with Oscar Slater is that he'd been planning his trip to America for some time. He didn't flee. The reason he didn't use his real name is he was dodging his ex-wife for money. And police learned within 48 hours that it wasn't the same brooch and it had been pawned a month before the murder. Police hadn't their man. <laughs> so sidetrack really quickly, early 1900s. <laughs> Crime and solving it evolving in two very different directions. The first is modern criminalistics. Testing of clues via science. <laughs> Backwards was criminology, a flawed methodology of using physical characteristics, measuring people's heads with calipers, and that turned out to merely be a scientific veil for Victorian prejudices. So when you're stuck, <laughs> well, here's the thing. If you're between science for the future and pseudoscience moving backwards, what is society going to choose to focus on? <laughs> it's almost like you know what happens next. Oscar Slater fits the bill for Victorian pseudoscience and prejudice, so he is the perfect patsy for this murder. Slater allowed himself to be extradited from the United States despite the fact that weak evidence could have actually compelled him to go. Why? because in Victorian society, he was actually really, really worried about his own reputation. And he figured, I'm an innocent guy. I can just put my hands in the justice si system in Scotland and I'll go free as a bird. <laughs> it took the jury 70 minutes to find him guilty. 
now as a prosecutor in San Francisco, <laughs> I can tell you he was absolutely railroaded from, from the drop. And Scottish system, another little quick aside, they don't go guilty, not guilty. They go guilty, not guilty, and not proven. Colloquially known as not guilty, now don't do it again. They also do a 15 juror system where you don't need to get everybody on board. There are no hung juries. So it took nine guilty verdicts to find him guilty of murder and he was sentenced to death to be hung within 30 days. So he gets to watch from the window of his prison as they erect the scaffolding. Two days before he's set to be murdered by the state, a reprieve, it's just transferred to life in prison. So hey, everything's fine. Did I mention that at this time there is no appeals court in Scotland? I am the last and highest court of appeals in detection. That's Sherlock Holmes in the sign of four from 1890. Who do we have when there's no appeals court? We have Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. He was born poor in Scotland, he became a doctor, didn't make enough money, so he decided to write about a detective for a little extra pocket change, and it turned out to make him a very, very rich man. So at the time that he became embroiled in the Slater affair, he was the Stephen King of the time. He, the average middle class professional was earning about 150 pounds a year. He earned 100 pounds per thousand words. It's a good guy to have backing you if you've been screwed by the system. So Doyle pours through transcripts of the trial. He gathers additional documents along with accounts and interviews from principals in the case. He never really meets Oscar Slater. He never really leaves his house. Like Sherlock Holmes from the armchair, he takes a rigorous case history from other Watsons running around getting it for him. <laughs> and Doyle published twice about the trial. First in 1912, the case of Oscar Slater, and it sold for six pence. That's deliberately low so he can show a really wide readership because he really wants to help this guy. When that didn't work, he tried again by financing another book called The Trial of Oscar Slater in 1927. Now that's a long gap, but between, between those times he was writing to public officials, he was writing newspaper articles to no avail. But in these books, he called out, among other things, flaws in eyewitness testimony, as we all know today, pretty imperfect science. At first, the witnesses who saw this murder didn't seem to be able to describe the person that they saw. At trial, he was the man. And how do we get this? I don't know if you've noticed Steen here. He's got that red hair, kind of pale skin, very Scottish looking. Yeah. Lineup of Steens and then the swarthy Oscar Slater. <laughs> and it's, they're all cops too, so they really look the part. Not only that, the moment before the witnesses walk into the room, they're shown a photo of Oscar Slater as if the de deck wasn't stacked enough. So further, there's a different doctor at the trial. The original doctor at the scene said, oh, uh, you see that chair that's covered with blood? I think that might be the murder weapon. At the trial, they said that the eight ounce hammer, itty bitty rock hammer, found in Oscar Slater's baggage, that was clearly the murder weapon. No forced entry indicated the suspect was known by the victim. And the jewelry, all of this jewelry and cash was left behind. And the only thing that seemed to be rummaged through was the paperwork. It almost seemed like the jewelry was a red herring. But the big point he made was that, consider the crazy one in a million chance that after all the evidence that had originally led the police to Oscar Slater, the crescent-shaped brooch, that the bottom fell out of that. Consider the one in a million chance that that still happens to be the guy. It's ridiculous. So after the second publication in 1927, the time was ripe. Everybody was dead. The prosecutor, the judge, the sheriff, all of them but Oscar Slater. So then we get the recantations. It's first, it's Helen Lambie, the maid. She states that she was, she had originally 
given an actual name to the person that she saw as someone she knew, but she allowed the police as well as other individuals to compel her and tell her that she had been mistaken. The police suppressed this evidence. Mary Barrowin, Barrowman, a 15-year-old girl who was outside who had witnessed someone leaving, prosecutors met with her 15 times and they got her to change her statement from, he looks very much like the man, to an emphatic, that's the guy. It, these new facts, these recantations in public papers made it impossible for the government to avoid things any longer. So, for, uh, oh, picture of Helen Lambie and the other person, moving on. <laughs> so, November 14th of 1927, after 18 years in prison, literally breaking stones, Oscar Slater is released. But in Victorian society, he is still not free of the stench of the guilty verdict. So there's an actual real inquiry. So in part due to Doyle's efforts, in 1926, an appeals court is actually created in Scotland. Woo. The only problem is it's is the way that it's created, which it can only hear cases that happen from 1926 onwards. They have to actually pass a bill in Parliament to get the Oscar Slater case heard, and they do that in 1927. What's the problem? All of the witnesses are unwilling to come to court for some reason. They're, they recant their recantations. So the only evidence that goes on for this second trial is the stuff that Arthur Conan Doyle found. And the ridiculous, terrible thing is after all of this, they find Slater not guilty, essentially on a technicality. The judge said in, in instructing the jury that a man of his reputation, basically a pimp, didn't deserve one of the hallmarks of the justice system, the presumption of innocence. And because of that, they kicked the verdict, but not in a way that would actually in the public view, exonerate Slater. So essentially, he got the not proven guilt verdict. Oscar Slater was compensated 6,000 pounds by the government, which is approximately half a million dollars in today's currency. And Doyle was a rich man. And this is going to sound really petty, <laughs> but under the gentleman's code, he would put up a ton of money to publish these books. He paid for a really nice lawyer, and he thought he should be compensated a little bit. But the thing that we forget is that while Slater was not a murderer, he never was and never claimed to be a gentleman. <laughs> and he took the money, and he ran. So who actually did it? That's a good question. <laughs> it's been 100 years. The evidence is, how do we say, stale? Police documents show that the maid, Helen Lambie, said at the time of the crime, she recognized the person who she's seen at the house as a frequent guest, the person leaving the house at the time of the murder. And she'd actually given them a name. Of course, over the course of history, that name has been redacted. <laughs> and all we have is a pseudonym, A.B., not the initials. She'd been convinced by the police and the Gilchrist family that she had been mistaken in her, her identification. Members of the Gilchrist family, soon after the murder, began wrangling over the estate and quietly accused each other of that murder. So the deal is, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle had a name for AB, but due to libel laws, he couldn't print it. They'll just don't apply to me right now. <laughs> so he thought A.B. was a man named Francis Chartres. He was one of Miss Gilchrist's de facto nephews. So from a very powerful family, connected all the way up, and the thought was that they actually would have had the influence to shut the investigation down and retarget the investigation on, again, the usual suspects, somebody that fit the society's prejudices. And the thought was that the real target wasn't the jewels, it was the papers that had been gone through because Miss Gilchrist had been indicating that she was gonna write a new will, cutting them all out. So 
upshot. What changed after the Slater case? Well, we've got an appeals court in Scotland. So that if you screw up, someone can actually look through the materials and help hold people accountable. Sherlock Holmes is no longer the last court of appeal. Criminalistics clearly won over criminology. And the Slater case remains as a perfect example of what not to do in lineups, interviews, and court prosecutions. So the toast to truth seekers searching in darkness, may a string of clues forever light your way. Oh dear, you are much taller than me. All right, we're gonna do this one more time, friends. Colin, since this is your third talk, count them, good. Would you like to join our fellowship? <laughs> he said yes. So I was so I was legitimately going to ask for my parents' permission to get pinned <laughs> because they are in the audience. But without their permission, I I, I don't I do accept. Thank yes. you, <laughs> and thank you all so much. It was a lot of fun. Yay! All right, friends, my darlings, it has been such a pleasure and an honor to be with you tonight. This has been so much fun. Please give a round of applause to all of our speakers this evening. Thank you. And well, I'm, I'm sure you may be sick of my voice and you all have places to go and sleep to be had. It's past my bedtime at least. Can I make a humble request? Can I? Thank you. As we mentioned before, this project is a real labor of love. Um, all of us up here are volunteers. Uh, and a labor of love requires funding to keep going. So please, if you can, join our Patreon, become a member, sponsor a salon, and help us ensure that this, our fifth season, is the first of many to come. Members and patrons enjoy a host of insider benefits from ticket discounts to more odd stories uh, from the odd salon fellows and speakers. Go online for more info or go hang out with Casey at Merch just because she's really fun to hang out with. I adore this place. This whole project and Annetta and Trey and all of the fellows mean the world to me. And it wouldn't be able to continue without all of your audience support and your love and opening your purse strings if you can. Um, and again, if you're sitting there all cocky thinking you can do it better, apply and do it better, I dare you. Um, submit your brilliant ideas at oddsalon.com speak. Join our email list. Keep hearing about our upcoming salons and speaker news. You know, find us on all the social. We all talk about stuff. And I do encourage you, head on over to Something Weird. All of our speakers tonight are going to be posting things throughout the next few days. Uh, and it's a great way to meet some of the, the fellow members of this community. Um, thank you to, uh, uh, to Public Works, to the speakers, the volunteers. And coming up next, join us for stories of unsolved phenomena and secret histories, unanswered questions, uncharted territory, and enduring enigmas of science on Tuesday, November 6th, here at Public Works for a known, curated by Tamar Baskin. All of that info is available over at the merch uh, store. Merch store, is it a store? Sure, okay. Um, and uh, please get tickets there. And I'd also like to tender a very, very sincere thank you to Amy for taking on the incredible amount of work and the curator's mantle. Crazy amount of work. Thank you so much. You did it with style and aplomb. And I love the sneakers. And as a thank you, I'd like to give you The Woman in White, one of the first Yay! mystery novels by Wilkie Collins um, and your very own uh, Harvlock <laughs> Holmes. Thank you, Amy, and thank you, everyone. Thank you. I went and bought one of these earlier, and they were like, no, no, give, give her the money back. We're going to give her one. Thank you, everyone. Drive safely. Good night. See you next time. Thank you so much. <laughs>